welcome to another episode of You've Never Seen with us, the host of Never Seen It Film Club. I'm accidental Emma Bainbridge and joining me as always is my fabulous, very dapper, very autonomous co-host today. I'm liking the green velvet. It's very nice. I feel we're matching. We are. Oh, we're melding. But it is Robert J. Simpson from Cinepunked. Bom, 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 bom. I really should just put a, a, a sound yeah. machine in here so I can right. do that. Must be easier. <laughs> you saying that my singing is not great? Very rude. Yeah, we'll just keep it silent from now on where you can just like, we'll get monitors yeah. and then you don't have to hear me being like, this is handsome Robert from Cinepunk. He's the best. It's like if I introduce myself at things, I tend to forget and I'll just go on and talk to people and people wonder why. <laughs> I've forgotten that I have to tell people why I'm there and who I am. Um, so I can't remember so what to say. Well, it's true. I'm like I remember sometimes who I am, but because I just about introduced myself today, I was about to say accidental Bainbridge. I mean that's true as well, but uh, who knows? So anyway, <laughs> welcome to you've never seen it, and today we are discussing the worst film on our list from our Z list series. Let's. The Room from 2003. I treat you like a princess, and you stab me in the back. You are tearing me apart, Lisa! Hey, Danny. Where's my money, Danny? Put the gun down! What the hell is wrong with you? Just shut up! Oh. Oh, hey! Stop. Hey. Stop! Get out of this world! So, The Room. Mm. It's a film with all the passion of Tennessee Williams which is on every tagline that I looked up, which I thought was great. I mean, it's a film in as much as it was shot on 35mm <laughs> and has been roughly spliced together and put before audiences and cinemas around the world. Uh, yes, that if that is your qualification for a film, then it is indeed a film. If you want to add an additional qualities like broadly competent, um, Narrative. A semi-coherent plot... Dobbing that matches the film. Yeah, then then I think that we, we have to um, maybe remove the <laughs> definition of film from the room. Just, well, I don't know if it's that bad. No, it is. It uh, really is. Go it's... on, tell me something good about the room, because as far as I'm concerned, there are probably zero redeeming qualities about it. The good things, good things about the room. I like the font. The font's good. It's not papyrus. Avatar, the giant international blockbuster, used the papyrus font as its logo. That's always a plus. <laughs> the original songs are pretty good. I mean, I feel papyrus would be more appropriate for it. Honestly, papyrus. Papyrus! Okay, there is nothing that I can point out that's a redeeming factor of the room. Like, we all know who's the pessimist in our little duo here. It's me. Hi. I'm the problem. It's me. Even I as the optimist in this, there's there's nothing I can say about the room that qualifies it to be seen by human eyes. <laughs> Cause the sound mixing is terrible. The li the lighting eh, is fine. The costumes are Cheap. Clothes? They're they're not <laughs> naked. There we go. They're not naked well, the whole time. Not the whole time. Some of the time. Yeah. Um. The yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 It it is. I would say, for the twentieth century to twenty first century, I don't think there's a film that has topped this as the worst film ever made, because even movie forty three was satirical and mm. knew what it was doing, whereas this is just a shit show from start to finish. Yeah, I mean, like I've, I've said in terms of the films that we have screening as part of this little run of, of our kind of Z-list films, that most of them probably don't deserve to be on here as a Z-list. Mm. This genuinely deserves its place as a Z-list film. I have reluctantly watched this, I think, for the fourth time. Um, have never been keen on it. Uh, I, I can't abide it, really. And the, the, the one redeeming quality was actually watching it with an audience 
kind of allows you to sit there and go, what the f What the what? What the what? What the what? The what? What the what? Yeah. Whereas when I was sitting at home watching it, I just wanted to murder the television. <laughs> and, you know, I, I we watched it for one of our very first Cinepunk podcasts. Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't keen on it then, and I sent lots of messages whilst watching it to my business partner kind of just complaining about why she'd made us watch it um so at least this time i had people around me who were going what 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 what, the, what? <laughs> and it felt slightly redeeming in that sense so i mean the one advice i would give anybody out there who feels brave enough to watch it is try and see it with at least two other people yeah i would say in so in the same room it, it is marginally better that way but as if and as a phenomenon i find it i do find it fascinating but the fact that there has been this cult following around it, um, again, to, to plug Zinnipunks, uh, we our third podcast, uh, Patient Zero, <laughs> if you're interested, uh, we interviewed Michael Rousselet, who mm -hmm. is of, of Five Second Films, and he is the man who's largely responsible for the cult uh, attendantship that has followed the film. Um, and I find that interesting because... You know, there's, there's, there's a whole culture that has built up around it. But as films go, I just find it hard. I mean, it, it frustrates me that there are people for whom they think this is a brilliant film and a, a great night out who probably have never seen a Hitchcock mm. or, you know, a, a, anything of any quality um, and would struggle with subtitles. But this is, this is a great film for them. I mean... The people who I've talked to who love this film mm. are definitely a certain demographic. And by that, I mean Stone University students mm. who think it is the best thing they've ever seen because it's the worst thing that they've ever seen. Mm -hmm. um, I've never met a sane person who's seen this film at all in any kind of capacity and go, yes, this has merit and is worth watching more mm. than more than 30 seconds of um i mean there is a pug in it i guess the dog is quite cute but it's not in it enough for me to redeem it oh hi johnny i didn't know it was you here you go that's me how much is it it'll be 18 dollars go keep the change hi doggy yeah there's just there's not even oh i don't know there's just a quality to it though that i can't help but love <sighs> When I was introducing this, I, I said to everyone that, you know, for years and years, the film that was often cited as the worst film I've ever made was Edward's Plan 9 from Outer Space. But the thing is, mm -hmm. Edward was a vaguely competent filmmaker. Mm -hmm. He may not be very good, but he had half an ounce of sense and there was, I think, some genuine talent in amongst there, or at least an ability. I don't feel Tommy Wiseau has any of that. And, the, the, you know, the cult that has build up around it and the, the sort of the fandom and the way that he markets himself mm -hmm. it's a great marketing ploy mm -hmm. I'm amazed at what he's done but it's a shit film in every single way and it, it's this notion that there are people out there who think the room is the best thing ever and spend all their time watching it and loving it and going and seeing it multiple times, not just once, twice, three, four, five times, when they've probably never seen a Hitchcock film or any film which has any degree of competence and, and skill. And the, the, the little snob in me gets really annoyed about that. Like, there are a lot of great films made in San Francisco. This is not one of them. Um, I, I, I just can't I can't find any enthusiasm for it I can talk about aspects of it and marvel at how it was produced and the mythology that has built up around it and the cult of the fandom that exists around it which I find fascinating mm -hmm. but as films go it's like pulling teeth I think that would be preferable I think I would rather go to the dentist for a root canal than watch this again I think I need a root canal. I'm sure I need a long, slow root canal. In all honesty, and just in case, I'm going to repeat myself. We all know I'm more of the optimist in this little demographic we have here. You've never seen 
And even I can't find a redeeming factor in this film. Not one at all. And you know what really grinds my gears is its cult status because it gets compared to the Rocky Horror Picture Show and it's nothing like the Rocky Horror Picture Show. And it really fucks me off. No, but the reason it gets compared to Rocky Horror isn't because of the quality of the film. No, it's because it's of the... It's, it's the cult that's it's built up around it. Like, we were throwing shit first. You can't just throw spoons and call yourself a cult midnight screening. My, there's, there's, there's wit and humor to a Rocky Horror screening. We don't just throw, I'm very passionate in case you haven't no noticed, but there's things that we do that make sense. I mean, room fans, I'm calling you out. You're just hooligans that leave messes in screens for no reason. There's no wit, there's no humor. You're just throwing spoons. When Brad Majors. To be fair, as big a fan as I am of the Rocky Horror Picture Show, I can't abide the uh, the cult around the screen inside yeah, there see, with that. See, this is I <laughs> I as a former shadow cast member, this is where me and Robert very much differ. I'm all about the shadow casting. I love the audience interaction and I love the throwing things um, that are witty jokes and not just me. Hello. I guess it's about a sense of trying to feel an ownership about it as well. This sort of interactivity that exists. And I mean, part of the cult of Rocky Horror isn't just about wit. It's about kind of snarkiness. It's a particular, I mean, because it stemmed from the American screenings. It's the kind of snarkiness and a, a kind of a failure to completely appreciate what was going on with the film, I think, at first. And then that just became the thing that was done. And people then expect that and learn their little scripts off and have a great time. I mean, I, I'm not dissing the fact that anybody is enjoying a film screening. Um, it's just a kind of spoiler for me who just wants to watch the film. Might have to have words. <laughs> but I, think, I, I, I think your point, yeah. I think it's good as well is that the Rocky Horror Picture Show definitely comes from a different place than the room as well. Mm. It is a comment on being, it's like it comes from, it is a deliberate kind of, not, I wouldn't say satire completely. It's a deliberate kind of poke at B films and like it comes from a love mm. of sci fi. Yeah. And it's deliberately a little bit weird and it's deliberately a little bit like it goes into all the tropes of this. Where's the room? It's. Mm. It's just some madman was given time, money, and let loose on Hollywood and and just made a thing that it, it's a fever dream. It's terrible. I don't. I, can't, I described this earlier, and I'm going to say it again. The room is is like the plot of a porno film without the porn. It's the bits that everyone skips through and no one cares about, but someone made it feature length, and then instead of actual pornography put Cinemax in there, like this, like those Channel 5 late night films. I remember um, those being a, a major thing where it's like soft core, like humpy humpy. And you're like, this is this is not what people want to see on a Friday. Maybe it is, but that's it feels like a teenage boy was like, I'm going to write a film that's going to be like really cool. And about every, I, I, it's just so bad. It's just so, I can't even describe it. It's just so bad. I mean, I mean the, the the story supposedly is that it is in some way semi autobiographical. It's Tommy Wiseau kind of extolling his own demons from failed relationships and his mm. bad experiences with friendships, supposedly. Um, oh hi, I, Mark. I, I, I hope that his sex life in real life is better, and he knows that humping the navel is not how to give somebody pleasure. Uh, unless, unless that's your that's thing. Unless that's your thing. We're yeah. not kink. We no. never would kink shame here. You've never seen it. Stop kink shaming me. Kink shaming is my kink. Um. So, I I, I mean, there is that, but he's a man who just had a, a, a lot of money. Where I find it possibly interesting is this idea that he originally had that the end was going to reveal Johnny as a vampire. I mean, that would make more sense. It, it kind of would a little bit, but then... It, then it's a Dracula allegory. Yeah, but it probably wouldn't have, have done much in terms of horror or anything else. It feels like a, a reveal at the end, which is cynical and gets a little bit more marketing. I mean, just the same as those, those five sex scenes that go on far, oh far too long. So much noise. Um, and, and, and you know, a bear, one bear back is as good as another. <laughs> it's, it's, 
I mean, no kink shaming again, but like, I need, I, I want a little bit more than that from a sex scene. I mean, yeah, it's not for everybody. The only thing I'll say is that, if, like, Johnny being a vampire makes more sense to me because if he was a vampire that had just woke up and was vaguely trying to integrate himself into society, mm. then of course he wouldn't know how to play football or like how to act like a normal human in a shop or or talk like a person from this century or and things like that but then it, i also feel like everyone else in the film would also have to be mm. aliens or vampires for that to make sense because they also don't act like real humans and are well then we could be weird. comparing it to rocky horror quite comfortably well there we go maybe they're all just transylvanians <laughs> um I, I, I mean the problem with it is essentially none of the characters make any sense <laughs> None no. of the dialogue makes any sense. Conversations are the weirdest and most stilted that I think I've ever come across um, outside of a 1950s B-movie. Oh, God. Um, they are... Like, nothing flows. Information is just <laughs> given. My favourite interaction is between Lisa and her mum. Mm-hmm. And it's exactly that, where it's like, so tell me, what's going on with you? Well, I don't love Johnny anymore. You need to love Johnny. He is this, this, and this. And then I, and it's like, okay, I have to go. By the way, I have cancer. That never comes back. That never comes back. It never comes back. You're like, is the mum okay? No one knows. Nobody wants to help me, and I'm dying. You're not dying, Mom. I got the results of the test back. I definitely have breast cancer. Yeah, it's it's like, you know, like you've been to writer school and you've learned that your characters have to have some stuff <laughs> and that if you give your characters a bit of backstory or some inciting incident, then they are more interesting to watch and the audiences will, will sympathize and empathize. But you haven't learned how to do anything with that. So it's almost like, you know, you've got your crib sheet. And it's like me, if I'm trying to create a character, I might write down a couple of little things mm -hmm. about them on a piece of paper. And I've stuck that in the dialogue, but I haven't put any context around it. I haven't done any build up to it. I mean, that's the thing. There's no dramatic tension within it. Just a little bit of tension would make it infinitely better. Mm -hmm. The only thing that's maybe slightly dramatic about it is the is the reveal of, of very slow reveal of Mark and Lisa's affair, um, which almost feels like it has tension. I mean, where it gets marginally good is whenever everyone tries to watch them at it, which seems to happen with careless abandon, like that child Danny that that exists for no other reason than to be a creep, I think. Like that, that, that character in particular, I'm like, how old is he? Why is he trying to get into threesomes, but also has homework? Anywhere between 13 and 25. <laughs> yeah, I'm just like, what are you? Who, 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 who's is he? Mm -hmm. Like, where does he live? Like In the apartment block. Wh with who? Doesn't say Johnny's looking after him. Johnny, I think, is... is if, if, uh, th these little bits and stuff that I actually picked up second yeah. time watching it, or this time watching it. Um, it's it's still... He's involved in drugs. He's got to get shot. So he, one would hope he's more than 13. But then he has a little... I, I and then his curtain, little curtain haircut freaks me out. Hmm. And it's that it is the very first fifteen minutes where it's that awkward, like, oh, I just like to watch you. I'm like, has he done that before? Well, you did say it was like a porno with all the sex taken out of it. it that's what I th I think that's what triggered it for me <laughs> earlier. I was like, oh my god, this is so like someone's written the da and then just taken the sex away and then been like, yeah, no, we're not actually going to have a threesome with this vaguely ageless person who might also be a vampire, judging mm -hmm. by what they're into. But I'm like. Yeah, and then, oh, what's the other friend called? The guy with the glasses. Peter. Peter. I'm like, Peter solely exists to be punched and held off of he's apartment blocks. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, supposedly the reason that he's not in the end of the film <laughs> is because he was only available for a short period. And he wasn't available because they, they, they screwed about that much with the timings. Honestly. I, I mean, The Disaster Artist, mm -hmm. which is Greg Sestero's book, and the film adaptation about the making of it um, certainly paints a very hectic and chaotic picture of this as a film production. And if it wasn't for the fact that Tommy Wiseau seems to be independently wealthy, mm. um, this would have been shut down long before. There's plenty of productions out there that are far more competent. I mean, you look, Batgirl doesn't get released, <laughs> and this shit does. I mean, R.I.P. Batgirl, because oh, by all counts, I'm like, 
Ruby Rose, attractive as they are, they're not the best actor. They may be the best left in the dark for that one. Is, is it is it the room comparative? Well, I don't know. Maybe she would have been quite good in the room. I mean, you know that they've done a remake of this this year. So the room has been remade this year as a charity effort that took them one day <laughs> with Bob Odenkirk starring as, t- as in the Tommy role. Um, it hasn't been released yet. It is due to come out. It is a charity effort. Okay. Uh, but I, I mean, even just the fact that they were able to shoot it in a <laughs> day. Probably with time to spare. You know, it's like just because re- it, it, there's not a lot to it. It's quite simple. It's it, it, like it just doesn't. And I dare say it didn't cost them six million dollars. <laughs> you know, no, they probably didn't buy two doubles of each camera and unnecessarily put things on green screen that don't need to be on green screen. Um, I, I, I mean, stuff like that just makes no sense. But again, this is where you've got somebody who is so naive, so ignorant of how things go on and is clearly ambitious enough and funded enough to make those dreams a reality. I think that's where I have a little, like, this much. Like, like, can you see? I'll zoom it in. Like, this much in endearing quality of the room is that Tommy was so genuinely poured everything creatively into this film and it's not done as a piss take he genuinely tried his best and i think that's why i i it is oh, don't get me wrong i never want to see a dark in my screen with this movie again but a little part of me is like do you know what i've never made a feature film i mean i also don't have six million dollars independently to put into a feature film mm. but i've not written a film i've not done all that and he did the damn thing it was awful, but he did it. Yeah, but that's, that's, that is no excuse. That's like all those people who go on, you know, Britain's Got Talent, <laughs> talking about their passion and how they love it and haven't got a no in them. Just because you care about something or because you want to do it doesn't mean that actually you should necessarily do it. And I'm all for, for people wanting to have private exercises and, and create. And like I, I take creative workshops and the thing that I'm always trying to do is to encourage people to do it. But one of the things I always say to people is that there are some people who should never put pen to paper, who should never attempt anything because they're not very good, or at least if they're doing it, they should keep it to themselves. And that's the objective bit that I think with something like this has to... to although I say that, and the cultural snob in me, the, the, the kind of the intellectual in me, the, the person who thinks he's got a modicum of talent himself, who's just jealous of someone having that <laughs> privilege, for $6 million, six million dollars, I can make several films. It's very true. Um, that's at least 12. But the, the, the frustration, I guess, is that this actually does have an audience, that it continues to grow, that it is unfeasibly popular. Yeah. So where is it, do you, where do you actually put that boundary in terms of what should and shouldn't get through? Because that's actually is what the question really is. It's not about whether or not this ain't good, because we all know it's shit. <laughs> the question is, do, you know, does any of us have the right to say that no shit art shouldn't be seen? Well, this is the, that that would be my question. It's like, who are the gatekeepers of our community? Because let's be honest, Sharknado is a thing. Mm. It's had several sequels. It's very popular. It's abjectly probably on par with The Room in terms of dialogue and special effects. Mm. And yet people love it. And it's been made over and over again. And there's genuinely love out there for films like this. And like, you know, not to, again, it's like, who 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 is to say what is art? I'm like, just because we, it's like Pollock. Like I mm. look at Pollock and I feel nothing. I'm like, that is a splatter on a canvas. I could do that in 20 minutes. It means absolutely nothing to me. Uh-huh. Or like, you know, some of those um, found object art, like. Um, like Michel like, Duchamp. Yeah, that like even stuff. Warhol, yeah, where yeah, you're like, yeah. it's the Campbell's can. Yeah. It's what does this, like that to me is not art. Mm. But who am I to say what is and what isn't? art and i would love it if in 10 years time tommy was turns around and be like comes out with a very posh english answer he was like like the end of the prestige it was like it's all a con i am just a, a wealthy lord who was bored and created this tommy character and you're all crazy because you've given me loads of money and ha 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 it's been like a performance piece well i think that's how he sort of s- seems to spin it from what i've been reading mm. about it you know like nowadays he 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 plays in a little bit to the idea that it was meant to be bad, that uh, he knew what he was doing in the first place. But the the stories that you hear about the production process suggest that that is absolutely not the case at all. Um, 
I'm reminded uh, that, that I mentioned this during my introduction to the film as well the other day. I, I don't know if you've seen Birdemic Shock and all. Speaking of similarly terrible films, I went to see that some years ago and the director for it, whose name eludes me temporarily, um, saw himself as the next Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, he genuinely thought... He was doing a film that was in part a homage to the birds, but he genuinely thought he had that same ability and talent. Whereas the reality is, he was another trashy filmmaker mm. who was, wasn't was competent, who just had the money and, and and thus the ability to do it. Just because you've got the money to do it doesn't necessarily mean that your stuff is any good. The, the, chance, the, the reality is, though, if you've got the money behind it, there is a better chance of your stuff being seen. Hence, Tommy Wiseau was able to pay $5,000 a month for five years to have a billboard yeah. advertising the room in LA, whereas lots of other talented filmmakers are lucky if their stuff is, is promoted for a couple of months. I mean, it's like every trust fund nepo baby out there, though, who thinks they're the next Tarantino, hmm. even though I'm um, like, why would you want to be the next Tarantino? But, you know, all these, like, boys who go off, and, and I say boys because, it, I mean... yeah. It's the truth. Um, who go off and make their like their short films, and then that's all they do. F and but they're like completely self funded, and they can afford to go off and spend like twenty five k a film, and <laughs> and do it all, and that gives them a career and keeps them out of their mum and dad's hair until they're in their thirties and they take over the family business or whatever. Um, who bore you on forums telling you that you're wrong because you did not like crazy or like the hateful eight, and you're like, well, okay, Brad. <laughs> I guess that's fine, but yeah, it, it is that 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 thing is like there is for me anyway. There is a certain amount, as you mentioned, jealousy of being like. I wonder how shit my work would be if I could just <laughs> make everything that came to my head. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, at least there's some honor in being a, a starving artist where you're like you have to convince other people to fund you. So therefore, there must be a little bit of merit in your idea, versus just going off and making whatever you want for the sake of it and not having anyone tell you not well I'm sure people did tell Tommy Wiseau not to do this and that it was terrible but he didn't have to listen to them because he was like well I'm paying you so mm -hmm. just do it um but yeah it's it's just <laughs> I find it very bizarre because I had never heard of the room until maybe six years ago mm -hmm. and it's the only reason I heard of it is because uh, QFT did a showing of it my friend Josh, shout out Josh McCullough, uh, he's uh, fucking obsessed with it. And he is one of the aforementioned Stoner Uni students who is obsessed with it. Um, but he would put it on at house parties. This is how I first interacted with it. And he would just put it on and be in the background. Mm -hmm. And I would ignore it as best I can. And then I, would be, I was like, Josh, what is this that you... And he's like, no, 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 you have to, you have to come and see it. And I didn't. Um, cause fuck that. Um, <laughs> but he'll be very glad to know that I've actually seen it now. And uh, it's just, I, I want to know what makes people go. Cause I, I don't know. I am a big fan as for mentioned of creature films. I mm. love like things like Sharktopus and ghost shark and, uh, Sharknado. Anything with shark in the title is genuinely like probably a good shout for me. Um, but I, I'm like, I love them because there's, a certain kind of reminiscent to a time gone by, like, because I, I love B movies and I love the old creature movies from the 50s. Mm. And that to me, I'm like, so I love those cheesy bad films because they are reminiscent of a good time. And I'm like, I just, I know we keep banging on about it, but I'm like, I just don't see the merit, the same merit in the, in the room. I'm like, why? Why? Why are we giving this screen time? Why are we putting more funding into it? Um, and all the rest. Having said that, though, I will be checking out Big Shark, which is coming out this month, which is Tommy Wiseau's new film. Charge this way. Over this one. How's your face feel? Feels good. Water, look at that. Oh, God. Um, shout out to that. Maybe that's how he's going to reel me in and make me love the room. Maybe it's a sequel, a prequel. Who knows? I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll take the point. I, I, th I think the thing that you're hitting on though with all those sort of older B movies mm. is that the vast majority of them are in some way sort of sensationalist exploitation. They're monster movies or, you know, they're creature features. Mm. 
or they're dealing with the atomic bomb or something like that. There is none of that peril and shock and cheesiness in this. Mm. You know, at least if Tommy Wiseau turned out to be a vampire at the end of the room, you could qualify it as a creature feature B-movie. Mm. But it hasn't got that. So it's a drama that has no drama. Uh, it's if it's a love story that has no love. <laughs> um, and it's a sex film that has <laughs> a very little actual sex. It, 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 the only the only thing I can say is that maybe it is a very interesting look at an Eastern European allegedly like Cold War style childhood look into what Americana was like. And maybe that's how it's an, an interpretation of somebody who doesn't quite get the cultural references. I'm like, maybe that's the only thing we can take away from it is that it's a screen cap of his mind going, ah, oh, yes, this is exactly what Americans talk about. They're, they talk about sex. They talk about football. They talk about promotions. Like, it's all, and like, because, oh my God, he didn't, get, oh, Jesus Christ. They talk about, uh, like, there's gifts, there's this, there's that, and that maybe it's that kind of playing a culture that's not yours and writing it weirdly. So maybe what we can take from the room is like, maybe this is how people, especially I would say in Asian countries, where we bastardize Asian culture quite a lot. That's how it's comparably be like, oh, this is Western culture seen through the eyes of someone who's not Western. Yeah, I, I, okay. I, I can actually go along with you with this one. It, okay. it feels like something from an Eastern European who has maybe grown up on a diet of American sitcoms. Mm -hmm. Thing that I love Lucy, that kind of thing. So sitcoms of a particular era. Because uh, I'm thinking about, you know, or I Dream of Genies and thinking about all the, mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 the promotions and all that ins and outs of apartments i mean actually that starts to make a bit more sense but without the humor without the humor and with a heavy thing of porn because again american pornography i think infiltrated eastern europe in a way that we maybe don't want to think about because when you think about what was contraband in the kind of cold uh war era like eastern mm. Bloc. I'm like, one of the big things was like GIs and shit bringing pornography over. So I'm like, if you imagine someone who's just watched I Love Lucy and then a really bad 1980s porn, you would you would create the room. <laughs> yeah, okay. We're going with that as a justification. I, I, I mean, so then it becomes this really fascinating kind of cultural study that still shouldn't be watched by any human being on the planet. <laughs> Yeah, it should be like put it in an archive and be like the little. No, don't don't, don't archive it. Put it in a box and set fire to the box. I'll put that flea in a box and then I'll put that box inside of another box and then I'll nail that box to myself. And when it arrives, ah, <laughs> I'll smash it with a hammer. Mission Impossible <laughs> style. This film will self destruct in five seconds and let's just be done with it. Okay. I, it I can could... live on in the memory as this thing that we talked about. Yeah, like, uh, was it um, Mark Cousins made a film a few years ago that he then destroyed after it screened a few times? Yeah. So most people never saw That's what should have happened to The Room. It should have been seen a couple of times and then destroyed and never talked about again. I mean, that is very fair. Although we cannot take away from the cultural and technological feats of The Room being the first ever dual shot film. I mean, the f I'm, I'm not sure if it, I, I know that was part of the emphasis about it. There are other films, I think, that have kind of shot simultaneously. But the problem is he shot it on 35 mil and digital HD at the same time. And only the 35 mil has ever seen the light of day, apparently. And I, I'm guessing because the digital was probably so woefully lit because they did relight for everything. But I'm like anyone who has any kind of tech film experience, you'll know the lighting between digital and 35 is so vastly different that I'm sure it was either completely blown out and impossible to see or on the opposite side of that was probably completely flat and not an, an image was seen I, or what I personally think has happened is they had that camera and no one hit record <laughs> they knew it would be so bad they are like it's bad enough we're wasting all this film let's not waste tape too no, I, I mean, honestly, I, I think that's probably, uh, again, with the excess of money that he had available to him. Yeah. There is a quote that there is still a snobbery around 35 mil that if you're shooting on film, you're a proper filmmaker. If you're shooting on digital, you're not a proper filmmaker. So therefore, there is no need to shoot on 
digital. You I would agree. I think and certainly back in 2003. I think we should still only be shooting on 35 mil. Personally, no, that's, that's not if true. If only we could afford it. Yeah, that's true. And not set it on fire, a la explosion. But no, I do love, I, I'm biased because I love 35, but I understand that digital is more environmentally friendly. It's better for editors it's better for getting your content out faster but then on my flip side i'm like but then that means that your content gets shoved out very very quickly um versus the skill that it used to be in shooting on 35 mil but that's on me being a snobby filmmaker and i just prefer it because i there's just something magical about 35 mil especially when you're in the cinema and there's a, a full theater it's just, it's a live thing. Whereas digital to me feels cold. Welcome to Never Seen a Film Club that distributes it to people around the world on digital. Well, if I could shoot this on 35 mil, I would. This is why you're so cold on this, isn't it? It is. Because you're just all digital. I just, all digital. So I have no, no love for this whatsoever. Um, and editing Emma also has no love for this because she has to sit and skip through it a lot. But, um... Oh, maybe that's what we should do for our anniversary. Should we shoot an episode on 35 mil? And if give it if you can get uh, Accidental to pay for a 35 mil episode, I will happily <laughs> take part in that. Um, but yeah, back to back to the discussion of the room. I don't. Do we have to? I was having more fun not talking about the room. To be perfectly honest, I don't think there's anything more to say about it. It's it's a shit film. If you want to go watch it, like you know, it's worth experiencing once in your life, maybe at a push, preferably with a lot of drink and a couple of friends and then never do it again. I would save yourself the trouble and just watch the cl best of room clip that's on YouTube. It's 15 minutes long. It'll save you an hour and a half of your life. No, I, I mean, I think the argument is that this film is so bad that no one believes me when I tell them it's that bad and you have to watch it to appreciate that it is actually that bad mm. because that was the feedback we got from the screening. Because I warned everybody it was atrocious and I couldn't believe and people were telling me, you know, like, I can't believe it's actually that bad. I thought you were joking. No, we would never, never seen a film, but we would never lie to you. No. And we promised that this was going to be the worst film on the list. And it is. Yeah, and Showgirls is on this list. And it, it's, no, it has merits. We'll talk about that in November when we watch it. But yeah, no, this is, this is definitely the worst film I've ever seen. Yeah, um, I mean, the only things I can think that would rival it are creature features from the 50s, and they have the redeeming quality of creatures. They have the, re and just the, the loveliness of, like, someone built a puppet. No one built a puppet for this. No one would want to build a puppet for this. It's, yeah, it's, worth, like, uh, there are, sin like, those, as I said, those skeevy Channel 5 late night skinny features, like, softcore porn are better than this. Do yourself a favor. Don't watch it. Like, Robert says watch it once. I say don't watch it at all. No. No, it can go in the box. It can go in the room 43? 42? Room 101. Room 101. I just want people to watch it so I'm not the only one who has to suffer. <laughs> Honestly. We can join a club. We can set up a, an institution, people who survived the room. Yeah. That could be an offshoot. I've never seen it film club. It could be like a, you did see it. We're so sorry. It's a support group for people who've seen The Room from 2003. You don't get your money back, though. Sorry. I do think it's quite funny, though. I think we talked about this earlier, that there is The Room, This Room, and then there's that really great film, Room, with Brie Larson. <laughs> and it, the two do get confused an awful lot, because when we went to book this film, that's the only one that's available um, on our regular distributor. <laughs> and uh, Richard almost got it. And I was like, no, 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 that's the good. That's the, That's a good film. That's not what we're looking for here. Um, unfortunately, it's yeah, it's bad, but yeah, out of ten, I'd give it not even. Uh, you know, when people ask you questions in the street to give you like an indicate to be like, what do you think of this? I would be that person who walks straight past and does not acknowledge the person asking the question. That is how bad this film is. So, what's your final rating? Out of ten. That's how. That's how bad it is. No reading. No reading. It made me leave. Wow. Out of 10. Wow. How about you? Minus 10. <laughs> the complete opposite, basically. As far away from 10 as you can get on a 100% scale. Yep. Okay. So basically our verdict is... Don't. Don't. But if you want to follow Accidental Theatre, you can do on most things at Accidental Theatre or Accidental Tea on 
the dreaded X, which we're not very posting to at the moment, so probably don't bother with that one. Um, but we are on Accidental Theatre on Instagram, Facebook, and we also have our Accidental Theatre YouTube channel, which you can see here, if I'm doing this correctly. And you can follow Robert and Cinepunk at... Uh, you'll find me under my name most places, Robert J. Simpson on Twitter, X, I'm Avalard, but you'll find Cinepunked on most places either as, as Cinepunked or on one or two spots where you are Cinepunked film. So follow us all there, um, subscribe to the channel, and we will see you next month when we're discussing Hairspray. Bye guys. Bye, 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 bye.